introduction, Greg. Um, I am a geek, so I'm not that used to talking to so many people in a room unless, of course, it's uh, online, but uh, we'll see how we go. Um, my presentation today is really quite vast, and as such, it's really going to be uh, very much a whirlwind tour of some of the things that not only Moreland Hall's doing, but a number of agencies uh, across the world. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is social networking, and I think um, the first... Whoop, we've got a... The first thing to take into account is that social networking is not new. Social networking is something that um, we've been doing well and truly before the invention of the internet. Um, if you think about the social groups that you were in 10, 15 years ago, we just communicated with our social groups differently. Um, I guess some of the point uh, that I'll be talking about today is about how social networking's changed that and what kinds of opportunities it opens up for us in the sector. So how can we use social networks to advance um, work in the AOD sector? I'm going to be talking about three points. Uh, the first being advocacy, the second being education and particularly with an emphasis on lifelong learning and lastly around how we can use social networks and social media for service delivery. So advocacy is um, is something that the AOD sector has been doing for a long time. It's something that's incredibly important when we consider the people that we work with. The people that we work with are stigmatised and marginalised and unfortunately traditional media quite often reinforces that. If we think about the, the broadcast news and print media and the way that they portray the people that we work with, quite often that does our clients a disservice. I guess one of the things that social networks and social media enables us to do is it's put the means of production for media in the hands of people like you and me. What's that mean? Well, it means that um, we can mobilise people, that we can reach a, a, a larger audience. Um, it should be said that social media has quite often been attributed as a causative factor for movements things like the Arab Spring and Occupy Everywhere. I think that's a far stretch. But what I can say about it is that it's enabled us to globalise movements. Local movements have become global. A really good example of this is um, some media reporting uh, by the Irish Independent, I think it was last year, that was highly stigmatising of uh, people who use drugs. The response to that news article came not just from advocates in Ireland, but right across the world. So much so that the, uh, the writer of that piece was complaining about the fact that he was getting hate mail from right across the world. Hate mail might be a little bit strong. People standing up for the rights of people who are marginalised was probably a better description. What's it mean for you and me? means that a person with nothing more than a laptop and an internet connection can actually be an advocate for the causes that we're passionate about. Doesn't mean, however, just making ad breaks for our organisation, a constant stream of look at us, look at what we're doing. It means making social connection with people. Uh, a really good example of this is uh, Overdose Awareness Day. Most people in the room would be uh, aware of Overdose Awareness Day. It's become a, a, an international event. Um, there was a couple of people on Twitter uh, in 2010 that said, hey, why don't we just attach a hashtag, a shared hashtag on Twitter to all the tweets related to Overdose Awareness Day in 2010. And what that meant was that people uh, within Twitter could follow that hashtag much as uh, people can follow the hashtag for today's seminar and get a stream of different people's thoughts around Overdose uh, Prevention Day. Um, that started last year. Moreland Hall took part in that uh, and we took part again in it this year. Last year we didn't have any measurement about how far that reached um, but Nigel Brunston, who will be uh, uh, teleconferencing into the uh, panel uh, later today, um, actually recorded metrics for this year's campaign. Um, Nigel kindly made um, that data, uh, preliminary data, available to me. Um, he'll be releasing it uh, 
soon on the internet, I think in the next couple of months. But I was able to examine that data and have a look at uh, the impact that Moreland Hall's tweets on that day uh, had and how many people it reached. And the interesting thing was Moreland Hall's uh, Twitter account at that time had about 160 followers. And the reach uh, that we made there wasn't much beyond those 160 followers. What that says to me is that it's not the content that's necessarily important, though it still is. It's more about the connection. That our advocacy online is very much premised in the connections that we make. Second thing that I want to talk about is um, education. And I think um, I have a real passion for lifelong learning. I think formal learning is really important. However, um, with the, the kind of moving goalposts that we have in the AOD sector, and, and Lawrence mentioned this before, we're in a sector that is subject to a lot of change. You know? New drugs come on the scene, new drug trends, new drug treatments constantly coming on the scene. How do we keep abreast of that in a timely manner? Formal education only gets us so far. So as a sector, we need to be committed to lifelong learning. Now, I want you to think for a minute about the teams that you work in. Teams share information with each other. I know that I'll be sitting at my desk and somebody comes across an article or something that they think is relevant or important to the work I do, they'll send me an email or they might send an email to the whole team. A lot of our learning is premised on our personal learning networks. If we think about our personal learning networks, it'll be made up of our supervisors, our colleagues, maybe other people that we've worked with in the past, mentors, and indeed service users. Imagine what would happen if that email, rather than going to the four, five, ten people in your team, went out to 100 people, 150 people, 200 people. That's the power of social networks. That's the power of things like Twitter. I didn't have a Twitter account until a year ago. And I have to say that in the last 12 months, my learning has grown <coughs> exponentially, just through contacting people, learning from others. There are a number of vehicles that we can utilise for this, including a number of specialist vehicles. Um, I know that Greg Logan, who's uh, emceeing today, was um, one of the initiators of the dual diagnosis support Victoria Ning site, a social network for people to share resources and information with each other and just have conversations about their work. It was that work that inspired Moreland Hall to start a similar site for harm reduction in alcohol and other drug workers called Heads Together. Um, again, it's a Ning site, it has more than 700 members, it's had over 10,000 visits, nearly 1,500 unique visitors from 24 different countries. It has more than 20 special interest groups and more than 200 links to AOD related videos and other resources. What have we learned? We've been operating this for two and a half years now. What we've learned is that uh, there's a lot of lurkers. There's not a lot of people in that community that are prepared to, to talk. But that doesn't mean that it's not of benefit to a greater number of people. Um, so we only have a small number of overt contributors over time. However, um, the impact of that is, is difficult to measure because people may be learning while not speaking. The last um, section that I want to talk about is service delivery. Um, and in terms of service delivery, I think it's important that the AOD sector make a shift to online. And the reason for this is that the AOD sector and harm reduction sectors have had a tradition of meeting people where they're at. We meet them uh, in venues where they might take drugs, we meet them out in the streets, and we meet them where they're at motivationally. And once upon a time, that was the local marketplace. And it still is, and I think that work's incredibly important. But what we also know is that people are sharing their lives online, that they're spending more and more time online. According to the Pew Research Centre, 52 million American adults, or 55% of those who have internet access, have used the web to get health or medical information. 26% have looked for mental health information. And 80% of health seekers say it's important to them that they get this information anonymously, without having to talk to anyone. 16% said that they had used the web to get information about sensitive health, uh, a sensitive health topic. And we could imagine that for a number of people, their AOD use is a sensitive issue. 
Moreland Hall's made a number of forays into this area, including uh, the Blue Belly website. The Blue Belly website was developed um, to address uh, drug-related harms associated with psychostimulant use. It was innovative in terms of that the harm reduction articles were actually wikis, that the users of the sites themselves could actually contribute to the information that was disseminated to people. Um, the Blue Belly Initiative combined a website, uh, film production, and also integrated uh, popular social networks like Twitter and Facebook. What we learnt from uh, this process is that, um, again, we had a number of lurkers but not a lot of contributors. And there's a number of theses, hypo uh, hypotheses about that, including the fact that people might want to share information about, um, about their drug use, or it might be just that people are lurkers by nature. What was more interesting was that in some ways, um, the Twitter and Facebook accounts attached to Bluebelly actually probably had more traction with our target audience than the actual site did. The last thing that I want to talk about is um, the future, where to from here. I think that the globalisation of advocacy will continue, that local issues will be taken up at a global level. I think that um, the integration of popular social networks with, um, with formal learning will become a reality where we will start doing formal online learning but it will also be combined with, hey, look what I've learned. Let's post it to Facebook. Let's post it to Twitter. Or where am I going to go and seek my information? Lastly, um, I just want to uh, talk about the future of service delivery. And I think there will be two uh, great moves in service delivery in the next few years. The first one will be around video conferencing, which has al already been used quite successfully in a number of uh, medical areas, and I think that we will be moving towards that in the future in the AOD sector. Lastly, um, mobile access. Mobile access to uh, internet uh, will soon, they reckon probably in the next 12 months, outstrip desktop access to the internet. This provides us with a great opportunity to provide timely, opportunistic and geolocated information to people as they need it. But we really need to think about how we're we going to do that. With that, I'll open up for questions. Thank you.